Hello and good evening everybody. I hope you're all well and thank you very much for joining us this evening for the 17th version of Let's Talk Decoin. Um, I'm really appreciative of all your attendance this evening. Um, my name is Wendy Conlon, I'm an equine specialist with Chagas and uh, just before we get going with this evening's webinar, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the webinar is being recorded this evening and the intention is to make it available on www.chagas.ie forward slash let's talk equine in the coming days. That's on the basis that technology has always worked with us and we can get that done. Um, you are, of course, this evening invited to submit your questions using the Q&A tab that is for most of you available um, when you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen. So um, just to say that the raise a hand function for those that, that attempt to use it, 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 it's not something that I can respond to this evening. Really um, be delighted to receive your questions over the course of this evening's discussion. So um, I am joined this evening by um, Romy and uh, Romy, Romy Marnadon, thank you very much for joining us from Weatherby Scientific. I really appreciate you giving your time to be with us here this evening and uh, happy to have you here with us. Uh, thanks for inviting me, uh, Wendy, and uh, inviting Weatherby Scientific to give a presentation and a chat to the readers. It's nice to have the opportunity to actually speak directly to the readers, uh, not something we often get. So Absolutely, no, I'm delighted to have you here and, and something a little bit different to what we've been doing today. So really interested to, to, to see the conversation develop this evening. So just um, to introduce you to everybody, um, Romy, you work as an international sales director with Weatherby Scientific and you bring over 30 years of experience in laboratory applications of genotyping in bovine, equine, ovine and canine industries. Um, you've had major emphasis on parentage verification and animal identity. You have a strong interest in the scientific area of agrogenomics, uh, traceability, food security, animal identification, animal welfare and the environment. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, that, that, that kind of covers it. I've been <laughs> so, from, yeah, a long time ago. Um, yeah. So um, happy to. So just, I suppose, just to say that my my background is scientific. I've come to the 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 sales side or the commercial side in the last four or five years. Uh, but ultimately, um, I'm a scientist at, at heart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so involved in the the technology side of things, and yeah, very very interested in how all how it all is applied to, um, how the science is applied. Um, and helps breeders of any species to make better decisions um, or be able to identify their animals, whatever they need to do. So, so yeah, so the presentation tonight is how, how does DNA testing support equine breeders? Um, and maybe we just, to kick off, just give a little bit of background on uh, whether it's scientific. Um, so, um, to, well, tonight, I suppose, if we go back to the introduction slide there, um, we're just going to have a chat about whether we're scientific, what we do, um, where the focus is on parentage testing, which is very important for breeders um, and the registration authorities, and also the identification of animals um, for various purposes. A bit about disease trait testing, what we, what we can do for, for people. A bit of coat colour because we know people are very interested in coat colour, and um, we get a lot of questions about that. And a little bit about what's going to, what's kind of coming down the the tracks for the future, and what's it kind of we see as the roadmap going forward for for the industry. Um, so uh, in yeah, I'm sure people will be. So just a little bit about Weatherby's and the background of Weatherby's. Um, so. Weatherby's are the, the holders of the, the thoroughbred stud books in Ireland and the UK. And the first stud book was, um, was published in 1791. James Weatherby was the, the man that did that. Um, he was recording pedigrees um, kind of as a by the by and was asked to uh, actually do a stud book. So that started off. And believe it or not, we're on about the eighth generation of the family now at this stage and they're still very much involved in um 
in the in the in the in the business. Um, but the laboratory itself, um, people might have known it back in the Equine Centre as as the Weatherby's DNA lab. Um, and that was established in, in, in 1985. Um, and that, that was for parentage testing thoroughbreds, really, for the registration uh, purposes. So it became mandatory in 1986 for parentage verification for anything going into the stud book. Um, so that's when the lab was set up. And believe it or not, 1986, that's when I started <laughs> way back when. But um, yeah, so it's been a, a long journey with the, with the, with the lab. Um, so when we started that, um, the non thoroughbred sector, Horse Sport Ireland and the Connemara's actually started as well back in the early 90s. So it would have been Board McGoppel at that stage and uh, the Irish Horse Board um, started uh, blood typing. I think, of, I can't remember exactly when, but it was in the early 90s we started doing the, the, the non thoroughbred. So it's been a long history with the industry. Um, and then in around uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, we went from blood typing. Um, people, some people remember the blood typing, but uh, to DNA technology. And the DNA technology that was chosen at the time was microsatellite technology, and that was chosen internationally. Um, it wasn't just our decision; it was something that was an international decision um, to move into DNA technology, and it just gave us um, better better efficacy around uh, the testing for parentage verification. So that's the, the current technology. It hasn't changed. We're still still using microsatellite technology. Um, and um, with that, we moved into doing other species as well. It, it allowed us to enter into the cattle side of things, into the dog side, um, and also into sheep and other species. So we started working multi-species when we started using DNA technology. Um, then in 2010, um, the cattle industry, or particularly the dairy industry, was starting to use this uh, gene, SNP genotyping, or the real term is single nucleotide polymorphism. So SNP is an acronym for single nucleotide polymorphism. I think most of us will have, be happy to stick with the acronym. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we say that it's it's pronounced like S N I P, but it's S N P. Yeah. And yeah. um, so what that what that's allowed us to do is we can look at a lot more data points, and it's used uh, primarily in the bovine and ovine industries now in Ireland for genomic analysis. Or and if anybody any of the breeders involved are cattle breeders as well, they may very well be involved with um, the beef data genomics program uh, for suckler cattle in Ireland so at this stage using these arrays we have um, and we we're you know we're doing the genotype for that as well there's well over two and a half million cattle SNP genotyped now in Ireland uh, for genomic purposes um, and I uh, correct I, I'd have to ask Sheep Ireland exactly how many oh sheep are done as well but we've done probably 20,000 I'd say sheep at this stage uh, for genomic purposes maybe a bit more maybe 30 um, so there's a genomic program running for, for sheep as well in Ireland through Sheep Ireland. Um, so that's we, we introduced that technology into the lab. So we have that technology running alongside the microsatellite technology or the, the STR technology for the equine as well. But um, we can see that this technology is being applied to all the different species and you know, it's on the roadmap, let's say, for equine coming down the road. So a little bit about the, the talk tonight, we'll, we'll go into that in the future when we get to, get to the future. So um, if we just want to maybe just um, move on then and we just uh, look at, the, I've already, I suppose, gone through the species we're already working with, like we are we're working with cattle, equine, just this slide just says we're multi-species, really working with multi-species, sheep and goats and companion animals, particularly dogs. Um, we do a bit of work there and in that as well. Um, but um, a bit of interest here, you might be interested to see what the actual life cycle of the sample is when it comes into the lab. So the, bre the breeder or the vet, you know, the, the vet really takes the sample. Uh, it's usually a hair sample for the non thoroughbred industry. We, we still use bloods in the thoroughbred, but that's just by the way. Um, so the hair sample comes in um, we do do an extraction of DNA on the hair sample. We're looking for good hair follicles, so you know, 
um, when you when you pluck these hairs or when the um, vet plucks the hairs, whoever's doing it, we want to see nice uh, big fat hair bulbs on the end of it. That's why we look for tail hair if possible uh, or mane, not, not off the body. So that's where there's nice DNA down in the bottom of the, the hair follicle. Um, so we extract the DNA, we produce the DNA profile. Wendy, there might be a few um, uh, animations there. So to just, I don't know if you want to click on. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, the, so just a little picture there of the, the hair follicle. Let's with them. And the, yeah, go again. And uh, once we produce the DNA profile for the animal, so we will have um, the sire and dam's profiles already usually in the database. Um, that's important that we have those there. We can't do the parentage verification without the parents. So it's very important that we have those in there in the database. Um, and once we run the foals profile, then we add that into the database and we, we run the, the data analysis to see is that foal qualifying as being out of the parents. And once, once it is, um, we report that back to the stud book then and, then and then they do follow on with their registration once they have all their requirements in. So that's, that's currently what we're doing. We use between 10 and 20 markers. Um, they're internationally recognized ones and um, that's what we do with that. Um, then maybe if, moving on. If I, do, if I just even before you move on from that slide, yeah. um, Romy, you know, I mean, you mentioned there it's so important to have the, the, the parents' DNA in the system. Yeah. And I suppose just, you know, what enters my mind is kind of the area of animals that are registered without pedigree um, or without mm. DNA and the, the, the system of, you know, I suppose as most of us know, the white passporting system. Like, you know, if we think about that for a second in the sense of, you know, what the implications of, of doing, of taking that action over the, the regist registered pedigree action, you know, I mean, what do you say, what do you say to breeders in, in the sense of that decision making and, and in the sense of, you know, the implications for the future around that as well? Yeah, so like it's very important um, for us to be able to, to qualify a parentage or if, if somebody comes back, they suddenly realise they haven't, you know, the white book or whatever, um, and they realise that this animal is looking good, it's looking good as in whatever breeding performance whatever um it's very difficult for us to parentage verify that animal if we don't have the pedigree in the database so i suppose a lot of those white book animals might you know might produce good offspring but they've no dna profile in the in the database um and um we can't parentage verify if we don't have that dna profile in the database so it's important for people to, to think about, you know, taking samples and making sure they have samples for DNA purposes. It's like a, a biobanking, it like a bio archive, really, you know, um, and like your your DNA profile, it's 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 an asset, you know, going forward, um, if you want to be able to parentage verify an offspring out of something going forward, we need to have the parents' information in the database, um. And even if technology changes, if we have the sample, you know, we archive the sample and the technology changes, we have, we have it in the database to um, take it out again and, and redo it with that new technology if that's what's required, you know. So really samples are gold dust, really. Um, and it's really kind of um, important for the integrity of the industry and traceability going forward that people are aware of that. Um, um, yeah, well, look, it's, it's, we've, we've had situations where animals have been exported, for in, instance, and there might have been an identity query or something. And we can share, so say it's gone to Connemara's, for instance, I'll go off to Sweden and Denmark and places like that. Um, we can send a profile away. Um, and if, if they want, if there's an identity query, say, when the animal gets into Sweden, they can run the DNA profile. We and we can send them our DNA profile and they can match it and see is it, is it the correct animal or, they, or it can be used for parentage verification in their, you know, their jurisdiction or whatever. So like 
having the DNA profile is really important from a traceability perspective going forward, and particularly if people want to be able to get full books registration going forward as well. So, and I mean, I would assume that the majority of what you're dealing with is probably kind of the straightforward parentage verification, but mm -hmm. you know, you have the other anomalies that come along, like you say, and you know, I mean, we spoke yeah. about situations whereby maybe you know one of the parents is is maybe not clear or you know where you maybe have a <laughs> the option yeah. that, that that sometimes arises where there's maybe multiple options for 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 a sire or whatever you know yeah. those things can mm -hmm. arise um and you know you have the capacity within the system when the, when the animals are in the system to actually be able to help to 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 shed light in those scenarios we can do yeah um we can we can if we have a qualifying dam of an offspring and there's a problem with a sire for instance we can potentially search the database for a qualifying sire and it'll come up if it's there in the system but if it's not in the system we won't find it so that that's the important point um you know um so yeah and like we do do a lot of um you know assistance i suppose sorting out pedigrees where sometimes um, we do have kind of changing folds. I think we spoke about that as well, Wendy. People don't believe it, but it does happen. You can have mares falling down the same night in the field or something like that, and the foals swap mothers. And it's not until the, the samples come in, you know, from the animals that it's discovered that the foals have actually swapped and they're, you know, they're with the wrong, right, with the wrong mare. Um, people don't believe it, but it does happen. Um, so, you know, there's that kind of thing happens all the time. Um, uh, that's a rare occasion, but it does happen. I'd say we probably see it once a year anyway. We'd have, you know, situations where definitely, you know, may, uh, with, with sires, like mares have been double covered or they're in a field running with a couple of stallions or something and they actually don't really know which is the qualifying sire, you know, um, until we do the DNA and, uh, yeah, we can resolve it then with, with, with DNA. So it's very powerful, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, there is a question here that has come in. Do you only use hair samples and not blood samples? No, we use blood samples as well. Um, the hair samples were really, for the non-herbid industry, were kind of selected for ease of sampling, um, I think was the, was the rationale behind uh, going back years ago. Um, we use blood still for thoroughbreds, but that, that's kind of you know a decision of the, the, the stud book necessarily you know um so yeah we can use bloods as well if if that's required there's a, query, there's a query come in there as well in relation to the cost of the white passports over the other but again that's a stud book issue at the end of the day and that's outside yeah, no, your that's outside of your call yeah. Control, yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. even though we can all see the logic yeah. of doing things the other way around yeah yeah, um, yeah. so uh yeah i'll um i'll move on okay to so Okay, so um, we thought people might be interested to hear a bit about the genetic diseases as well and how, how DNA testing can help with that. So I suppose the two, two um, I suppose, most common ones or obvious ones are hoof fall separation disease and warm fragile fall syndrome. So we, we can go into depth a little bit more with those. Um, the hoof fall separation disease are, uh, um, was reported back in the 1990s in, in Connemara, observed in Connemara. Um, and anybody that's breeding Connemara may very well have come across this. Um, so um, yeah, the hoof, um, the, the dorsal hoof wall starts to separate away. Um, and um, there is now a genetic test for that since about 2015. So um, if um, it's autosomal recessive, so what, so what that means is basically you have to have, for an individual to be affected, it has to have got a copy of the defective gene from um, both parents. So yeah, um, you can see there that the, the blue line, if, if we look at the little diagram that, that um, says recessive inheritance patterns there on the, on the right hand side of the screen, um, so the, where the blue line is, that's indicating that the, the parent is a carrier. So um, one of the parents is a carrier in, in both in, in both men. So we have two chromosomes, a good one and a bad one, let's say, where the gene is and, and bad one. And when you cross um, the potential out offspring coming out of this, this mating is that you will have one affected individual where the, the, car the, the um, defective gene has been passed on by the sire and the dam 
Okay, so you can have one affected offspring and you can have two offspring that would be um, carriers and then one unaffected. So you have a 50% chance of getting a carrier and a 25% chance of getting an affected individual. So that's if you made two carriers together. And I think if we go on further, then um, we, we can kind of go into that a bit more. So we, we show that if you made two non-carriers together, you can't get an, uh, an affected individual. So you get 100% non-carriers or you, you won't have an affected. It's not possible to have an affected individual by making non-carriers. But the problem there is if, if you select just non-carriers and don't include the, the good, the animals that are carriers, you might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater in that you might be throwing out good genetics. But because we can test for this now, you can manage your matings. So, and you want to keep the diversity within the breed. So I think the next slide, if we go to the next one, um, it'll show you that if you mate a carrier to a non-carrier, what the likelihood of the, the offspring will be. So you get 50% non-carriers, 50% carriers, and you won't have any affected. So you're not actually you know, going to produce an affected animal by mating a carrier to a non-carrier, and you're keeping the genetic diversity within the breed. So you're not, you know, you're not throwing out good genetics with the bad genetics, if you like. Um, and I think the next one just goes on and it shows um, where if you mate the two carriers together, um, which we already discussed really, um, what you, you get, you'll get, you know, you've, you've potential of getting an affected individual here, a one in four chance or 25% chance that you will get an affected individual. Um, so, so really it's, in, it's, in essence with, with, with this, you know, with this disease, the power is in the knowledge, the power is having the information to begin with and to be able to make those informed decisions and not, yeah, to, it's like, not to fear, not to fear the, um, the outcomes then. Yeah, it's like, um, um, you know, precision breeding, basically, you know, it's, um, you know, you're making, you know, it's a tool in the toolbox, why not use it? It's there. Yeah, um, and right. I know the Pony Society are keen, um, you know, for people to do to do their testing. And there was yeah, a, an they, offer. They've certainly been very good about providing some opportunities for free testing and that as well. And one of those opportunities that's only just closed up in the last couple of days there again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, um so that's the, the um, and just to be mindful, I think on the next slide, we just like to be mindful of what the, you know, the, the breed management considerations are, you know, that um, a hoof fault separation is, I suppose, it manifests itself in varying degrees of severity, and that's probably down to a bit of management and whether the farrier is there, or whether your, you know, your animals are out on soft ground or hard ground or whatever else, I suppose, wear and tear on the hoof and that kind of thing. Um, but because the genetic test is there, you can manage, you know, you can facilitate your breed management and you can manage, you know, um, your breeding decisions. Um, there was approximately about 17% of the population, Connemara population, um, were hoof fall carriers. Now, you know, that might be, that was um, a statistic from a study that was done a few years ago. So with the various um, implementation of, you know, um, testing over the last couple of years, that might be down. So, you know, at some stage, maybe we might, try to have a look at that. Uh, we'll have to have a chat with Connemaras and see the Breeder Society and see, do the, you know, at some stage, want to have a quick look at that again. They might have done it themselves, I don't know. But um, it might be down a bit on that. But, um, and just to be mindful that if, you know, if, if you're concerned about breeding with a carrier, that, you know, you don't want to be cut, chain, cutting off the genetic diversity and just be aware that you can't manage the breeding basically with carriers. Um, so that's the whole fall. Um, and then the next one of interest, I think, is probably the warm blood fragile foal syndrome. Um, now, this one, um, this, this, this has come to light really in the last few years as well. And we started testing for this. Um, it's similar to the hoof fall in its mode of inheritance. It's, it's an autosomal recessive as well. So the same thing, you need to have... Um, um, two, two of the bad genes basically for an animal to be affected and it, it can affect males and females equally like the hoof fall can. Um, th there's a bit of a description there of the disease but primarily it's a disease of the connective tissue so the connective tissue is very fragile um, and malleable and um, it can lead to very nasty kind of situations where basically the skin of the animals doesn't form properly um, and it causes other things like um, hyperextension of limbs and 
uh, high drops in so kind of brain uh, swelling and stuff like that so it's it's a nasty disease and the thing here is that the foals have to be would have to be euthanized um you know if um if um they're affected individuals um and i think i don't know if we can see the last uh, button there but um yeah, it's not rolling yeah. down to me, but it, it is eight to eleven percent, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's about nine to eleven percent in the yeah. in the warm blood population. Yeah. Um, the instance of it, mm -hmm. so uh, it's a it's a kind of significant enough one. Um, so it's just to be mindful of it as well uh, with warm bloods and crosses with warm bloods and that kind of thing. Um, so um, I think we have a few pictures there um, as well um, of what it actually does. So these are. So you can see it's quite a nasty disease. This is a picture of a foal's leg where um, you know the skin hasn't uh, has, has has gone basically, and it's it's quite nasty. And then the intestines. The other picture is where the intestines, where the the wall, the abdomen wall has has enclosed and is open. And so it's you can see it's not a not a very pleasant disease. So important that we can do some testing for this, and you know avoid having the likes of these foals, you know, born, you know, so important that but you from, wouldn't be from, a, from a welfare mindfulness welfare, perspective, yeah. you know, um, yeah. sure. Yeah. And, and I suppose as much as that, you know, as well, I mean, you know, like you say, these, these, these foals generally end up in a euthanasia situation. So in that scenario as well, yeah. like you've lost a year of, of produce too. So it's an economic, it's a significant economic loss to the breeder as well too you know in that regard yeah. Um, yeah. and just like from your own perspective and dealing across kind of I suppose across across the various different livestock sectors and when you see a disease like that is as you say here like kind of nine to eleven percent of the population would you consider that you know when compar in comparison to across the board is that is that reasonably significant yeah, it would be a significant enough figure, all right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a it's a carrier, uh, you know, incident. So like, uh, the number of affected shouldn't, you know, it would be lower. But um, it it's a significant enough uh, incidence for testing. You know, if if it's you know if it's there in that, uh, you know, th th to that degree, because you really don't want to be mating two carriers together. Uh, you don't want to be getting affected individuals here, you know. Um, so, and, yeah, I suppose like, obviously H Horse Port Ireland have been doing screening for this for the last, I think, about two years now. Well, they, they did, they did, um, they did a year of it. Um, <laughs> not sure where, you know, you'd have to contact the readers have to contact Horse Port Ireland um, about it. Um, yeah. So but to see what the instance is like, because I'm mindful, I suppose, that you know the population here is uh, not you know it's not all all warm bloods um so um it's it's in the it's it's in the warm blood population you know but it, it's it's i get guessing being mindful of crosses you know when people are crossing yeah. Bloods, really um yeah. so um but the i'm not I mean, sure I, what the obviously i suppose like there's there's, st population. there's stallions that are in the the stud book that you know they where they they have been have been tested and where you know they disclose their status and so forth and you know then it's a case of you know the mare owner then needing to fulfill their side of the testing to be able to see like the mechanism that you showed there for the um for the whole fall separation disease it's the same the same mechanism mm -hmm. of carrying and and crossing so you know yeah. it's 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 yeah. that information on both sides is needed to fully yeah. arm yourself yeah, it's, again, it's it's the tool in the toolbox. Why you know why not use it um, to avoid producing an affected individual? Um, so yeah, it's it's about precision mating, I suppose. You know, just being 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 mindful of it. And I, like all the breeders, I'm sure are, are careful about that anyway. Um, there's a there's a question. Has come, yeah. there's a, sorry, uh, Roma. There's a question that's just come in. Um, is the carrier rate of this gene? I'm assuming we're talking about the warm blood fragile foal in Irish warm bloods higher than in other countries? I don't know. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. So I don't know that. That that's yes. like that 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 is a, from the publication, you know, which would have been done on um the Dutch warm bloods, I think. Um so um 
that's where that instance comes from. I don't know what the instance of it is in the in the Irish warm blood population. Well, I, I presume um, that's information that Horseport Ireland will come to to um, yeah. to release at in time as well. Too tested, you know, the Irish warm bloods. I don't know many of those are tested. There's another, um, there's another, there's another query here just to come in. It's a little bit more pointed, and it might be one that we might need to return to at a later point. And um, it asks, how do you manage the identification of the gene when it is protected by a pa uh, by protected or patented by a lab? And do you use nearby loci? Um, I think that might be something that we might return to at a later. At a later well, point. just on that, if like this, this one isn't under patent. Mm -hmm. But if they're under patent, we you know we'd have to have the license, and if there's a royalty fee associated with that, we do have it with cattle, um, you know, uh, where there are licensed ones that we'd be testing for, and you know we wouldn't test unless we had the license, and you know we're free to to report, basically, yeah. There's usually royalty fees associated with those as well, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah. yeah. If we if we move along, maybe into coat color, and we can come back if some other questions come in on any of that, I can revert back across to it. But I'm just watching the clock as well. Yeah, and uh, coat color. Then I know people are interested in this, and that list there is really just kind of I suppose the ones we'd be hearing most about. People would be most interested in. Um, so chestnut bay, black, grey, Tobiano, uh, blue eye cream. Um, for the populations that we deal with here in Ireland, um, Tobiano and Blue Eye Cream are ones that people gen generally are interested in. Apart from the thoroughbreds, tend to be all you know, um, kind of solid colours like chestnut or bay. Not so much black, but we don't really see that. Yeah. Greys and Connemara's. Then you'd see the greys and the creams and that kind of thing. So. Um, so a little bit about the genetics, maybe, I think if we move on on the slides, just to go through um, what is cold colour or how does it come about? And it's, it's either the, the presence or absence of melanin in the skin and hair, um, and then eye colour, because everybody's interested in the blue eye creams, I suppose. Uh, um, it's, that's determined by melanin within the eye. Um, and basically, there's two types of melanin um, pigments. There's a black and a red. Uh, the, the scientific terms are there, you, Melanin, and the, the <laughs> red. Um, and if we just move on, then they're controlled by two. Uh, there's they're, the, let's say, the production of the melanin cells and the distribution of the melanin cells are controlled by two, two systems. So first of all, it's the production of the pigments. And then secondly, it's the distribution of those pigments throughout the body. So we de if we then move on, you'll see what the, the two are. So um, the base coat colors are really the foundation of the coat color. And it's these genes, these two different genes that, that control those colors. So the chestnut bay, brown and black. Um, extension is, it's a funny name, but anyway, extension yes. E mm -hmm. is the gene for the the pigments and depending on what the genetics are on that you'll either get the red or the black pigment being um, distributed and the, the agouti then or the A that's the gene that um, codes for the distribution throughout the body so I think it's probably on the next slide that we, we go into that so yeah so the extension there also known as red factor, people hear about the red gene, but it's really, it's actually, it's the red or the black pigment. Um, and depending on the genetics, you'll either get the red or the black pigment, or you get a combination of the two. Um, if, if you've got this little, the, they're denoted by big E and little e, the genes, or the, um, and if you've got the big E, it'll be the black pigment. If you've got the little E, it's the red pigment. Um, and so, um, I have a table here at the end where we we'll go through that, but just the GUT e gene then, or the A gene, that's the one that controls the distribution of the black pigment. So to the mane and the tail and, you know, the, the legs and all the rest, that's to the points. Um, so that, 
so um, it, it distributes. If it's not present, if it's present there in the recessive state or the small a, um, it, the pigment goes just uh, uniformly across the body, so it doesn't go out to the points. So if we move on, then we I think we have the table. So here's the table. Yes, showing different things now. It's probably a bit complicated, but if we just look at the chestnut, you'll see that the red red pigment. If you remember, the red pigment was the little e, little e, um, and the the it, it, there's there's no black pigment, so it's not there's no distribution to the of, of black to the points. So that's why they're all red basically. Um, and then the chestnut again. The big A has nothing to work on, so it's no. It's it, it distributes the black, so the, there's nothing to work on there because there's no black pigment. So the chestnut. These are the the kind of genotypes you can see for chestnut. As long as there's two little E's there, it's red. It's yeah, yeah. Um, and then the black then is the big E. So we have the big E. There's going to be black pigment. Um, and if there's no big A. It'll be black all across the body, all across the body. But once the big A goes in, then you start getting the black to the points, to the mane and the tail. So um, that's kind of how, how it works. And the other phenotypes then are, you know, what you see are basically combinations of those um, genes. Now, base coat is like your tin of paint where you've got your base coat. <laughs> and so they're the under nice way colors. to describe it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you can modify your colors by throwing in lots of other genes. Okay, so there's about ten other genes, at least at least ten other genes that if you kind of throw in a bit of cream or a bit of silver or whatever in on top, you will get different coat colors. And so that's where the, the, the blue eyed creams come out of, and the palominos and Bonds. your tones, and you know you get your silvers and. Um, all that kind of stuff goes on. So, and from, um, from your experience, you know, with Weatherbees and over the years and like where, where the, I suppose the interest comes from the sector, you know, which are, which are the, like, from where are, te are tests most demanded? Is it, is it from Connemara people? Is it from the, the we'd say the pipe Connemara's. Uh, Connemara's and um, I suppose Leisure Horse Ireland sometimes would be looking at Tobiano for the, the pie balls and skew balls uh, are the paint horses. And the Tobiano is, um, that's an interesting one because it's a kind of a flip-flop of a bit of a gene in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, which, which determines white. So you get, you can actually, we can test for that, you know. Uh, to see if they're carriers or not of the Tobian. And Tobiana is actually dominant as well. I didn't put it in here, but the, the genetics of that is quite interesting. Um, it's dominant. So if you have a Tobiana gene, you're going to have white, that white spotting pattern. And it tends to be, the, the white spotting patterns are quite interesting and quite complex, but uh, for Tobiana, it tends to be that the white kind of comes across the body. It's like as if you had your whole colored animal and then you threw Tin of paint on top of them, white paint on top, and the, the, the paint kind of goes At to various different. levels of the various, yeah, you can have various levels of white across the body. <laughs> and then the opposite to that is a one one called a Sabino, where it's like as if you you could have stood the, the horse into into a bath of white paint because the white comes upwards rather than downwards across the Animal. But I suppose for certain breeders, you know, this actually, you know, to know and, and be able to make decisions around colour, you know, for some, I mean, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the other aspects of confirmation and soundness and all the other bits shouldn't be right to begin with. But when all those kind of ticks are in the box and, you know, they want to then look at the colour colour aspect or make choices around that, this can be very useful. As a matter of interest, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't actually um, ask you if you have this information to hand, but um, the, the, the cost of these kind of tests, are they? Um, it, it, it depends, actually, I, sh I probably should have had that, but I don't have it on the tip of my tongue at this point at the moment. But it's I'm sure they're probably on your website anyway. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, funny, they're reasonable well, enough. You know, contact the, yeah, people can contact the lab, you know, if they, if they are interested in having any co colour testing done and, you know, we can we can organise to, to, to do it for them and give them the pricing at that stage. Um, the one I the other one I suppose people are interested in is blue eyed cream. So the cream gene, 
and there's I think we've a little bit on that. So Connemara's would uh, these are I've just this is a kind of a list of the ones that we call them the dilution. They dilute the base coat colours, but the cream ones and the dawn, I suppose, are the ones people are most interested for Connemara's. But I think if we just go on, you'll see the, the cream effect. So um, the column to your left there is where there's no dilution effect, okay? Um, from so there's no cream genes in you know the, the cream gene is not in the, in the animal's genetics basically, um, so you get the, the base coat colors. But once you you add in one copy of the cream gene, you start to get this dilution effect in the coat color. Um, and if it's a chestnut and you've got one cream, it goes to a palomino. If it's a bay and you've one, it goes to a buckskin. And if it's black and you've one cream gene, it goes to a kind of a smoky black. But then if you go on and you put in and, and it's got it's got a cream gene from each parent, then your chestnut goes through a camello, which is kind of is really the, the blue eyed creams that we, we see from Connemara as most most of the time or a perlino when if it's a bay or a smoky cream if it's a black. And if they've got the double cream gene, then they tend to have the blue eyes as well. So that's where the, the blue eyes come from as well. So it, it, it not, this gene also affects the melanin in the eye. Um, so you get the blue eyed creams. So I think we might have a, a picture. It's not a very good picture, but we have. Oh kind of my a goodness me! Oh God, I, I should have should have seen this first. Yes, we'll move yeah. on swiftly. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got a little bit of a stretch through the middle. They got they a, a little bit of that. It's not a great picture. The picture got stretched a bit, but yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Okay. So um, okay then. I suppose. Uh, there's no question. Are there any questions around that? I'm just going to have a little quick check to see whether there's anything on the call. There is some questions coming in now. Hold on a second. Um, what is required education-wise to, education to work in this very interesting area of genetics, science degree, oh, PhD, oh, etc. So, yeah, somebody, yeah, somebody interested in the area of work. All of that, yeah. yeah. So, science degree, yes. Um, from like we do have a lot of science graduates, so um, people coming out of different science graduates. So um, I suppose biomedical science type people or, you know, sometimes we have ag science people that have come through the, the, the ag science thing. Um, but yeah, a science degree is kind of where, where we, we need people um, and for gen geneticists as well. So the genetics, anybody that's doing genetics. Um, the Certainly other changing area, times coming for the future and they'll need to be the well future, armed. Yeah. The future forward. is yeah. bioinformatics um, would be a big thing. So people with data analysis is very important uh, for the future going forward. And working in the, the cattle industry, particularly and the sheep, a lot of, like the, producing the data is one thing, but actually interrogating it is another Okay, so having people and I'd that suggest are... that anybody you know maybe they might make contact with yourselves, whatever as well yeah. too, to discuss that out a bit further. I'm conscious of the of the the okay. clock moving, and we'll we'll okay. dig into some of this because I think this is the meat to finish the conversation as such. You know, the future where we're yeah. going in the future. So we we're talking about um moving the technology has moved on from microsatellites, and this is the change in time. So this is kind of the current situation where we're using about 17 microsatellite markers and they're little just pieces of DNA, little bars of DNA that we're looking at. We can do parentage verification. The, this, this image that uh, you're shown there is the chromosomes. There's about 31, 32 chromosomes and the little red marks show the points on the chromosomes that um, the microsatellites are on. So the coverage is minimal across the, the chromosomes. Um, that we're looking at the DNA markers. Like when so, you say a marker or a microsatellite, Romy, what do you precise, like? What does that tell you as such? So in everyday you, like in the everyday Joe Soap language. Okay, so I think <laughs> probably people know that your your sequence of DNA is made up of a string of letters, basically. Um, and so a marker is here. We're looking at um, what we're looking for is a repeat sequence of letters within the DNA. Um, and so there, um, it might be, you know, um, a short piece or a long piece, but it's, they're genetically inherited or Mendelianly inherited from parents. So we're, we're only looking at these little specific areas on the genome 
they're not they don't um they're not coding areas they're we just know that they're they're fixed in inheritance pattern like in mendelian inheritance so we're looking at those but we're only looking at 12 or between 12 and 17 markers or between 10 and 20 markers and we can say um, and it's only really suitable for parentage verification and identification it's suitable for identification as well if traceability um, a small bit of population genetics and a small bit of trait mapping but that's 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 as much as you can do with it when you move on to the next technology that we're moving into which is being used for genomic analysis definitely a lot now, more red here <laughs> There's a lot more red, so we're looking at a lot more DNA markers across the genome, okay, across the whole of the animal's DNA. Uh -huh. um, and by having, by looking at more of the DNA, you're getting a lot more information out of it, okay. So we can do a lot more with it. So we can do parentage verification like we always have done, but with that, we can also do. Um, allocation or, or parent discovery now that going back to the point of the dna in the system it has to be in that in the database um, to do the parent allocation or parent discovery you must have the parent in the database their dna profile in the database for us to find them so if somebody sent us in an animal they don't know the parents and we they I say can you allocate the parents to this we'll say well if they're in the database we'll allocate them but if they're not we won't be able to do that um, so that's what we can do a lot more and um, the, the, the technology that we're talking about here are arrays or snip chips you hear them called and all kinds of things but they have anything from 50 markers up to 670,000 50,000 markers to 670,000 markers the most commonly used one would be in or around 50 to 70 80,000 markers um, and with that you can look at they'll have all the genetics we were talking about, your coat color, your diseases, all of those things will be can be on these chips um, and you can be testing for those at the same time as you're doing your parentage verification. Um, with some data analysis, you can look at inbreeding, monitor inbreeding, you can look at breed composition. So sometimes people would say to us, how much of a Connemara is in that animal? Well, currently we can't tell you, but when we have a database built up on, the, on this particular type of array, um, we'll be able to tell you, we'll be able to say, you know, it could be, you know, there's so much thoroughbred, there's so much, um, you know, from the DNA and be, you know, be kind of reasonably accurate about it, you know, what, what it's going to be rather than, you know, by just looking at a pedigree, you know, you can say there's, because DNA is inherited in, in blocks of DNA. We all think that well, there has to be half from the mother and half from the father, but we know like, if you've got brothers and sisters, none of us look the same. We've all different abilities and all the rest. And that's down to the, you know, a large portion of that is down to your genetics, you know. And obviously there's nature and nurture, you know, uh, as well. Environment uh, affects things as well. But, um, you know, the blocks of DNA from the mother and father depend on different genes. Sometimes you get more of a block of DNA for a particular trait from the, from the mother than you do from the father. And, you know, so what the DNA that's that's due to how the germ cells are are produced and meiosis, mitosis, and cell division and all the rest. And so um you get different blocks of DNA and that affects the traits differently. So by actually going in and looking at that block or going in to look at areas around that block, you can you can do more um that that's the basis of genomics so you can do more kind of in-depth look at an individual and what it's likely um performance is like going to be or that kind of thing so this um and the inbreeding as well how close they are and all the rest so by expanding out the amount of information you're gathering with a test and um, you're you're just you're you're increasing your knowledge base and you're able to do a lot more with the data. And this is where we need the data an an analysts for, you know, that's where they come into their own. Um, yes. So you also we need can use all the data. As well as the data analysts, you also need the data to begin with as well, too. Exactly. And it's things yeah. like, you know, supporting inspections and that phenotypic assessment and all of that that needs yeah. to happen as well. That bank yeah. of data needs to be there to, yeah. to, so to we, support maybe, all of this. Yeah, if we move on a little bit. Yeah, for um, so I, I have a few slides there and in on on DNA moving on, but um, 
this is the current STRs, this is where we're at, 10 to 20 markers. If you move into this SNP genotyping on, on these arrays, you're looking at thousands of markers per individual and you're looking at one little change in the DNA sequence. So if we look at the, the, red the, the black string of letters with the, with the red in the middle, we're looking for a change, one change, whereas on the STRs, you know, they're just little blocks of repeats. But the, that's the important, the, the, this SNP. So that's the single, the, the letters are called nucleotides. So a single nucleotide polymorphism. Polymorphism is a change. So that's where the, the, that acronym comes from. So that's what we're looking for with these. And we're looking at thousands of them when we're going to these arrays. So increasing the, the, the knowledge base of the DNA of an in individual animals. So if we move on there, um, so a little bit on inbreeding, I don't know if we want to go through this. Maybe if we go down to the, the slide um, that shows the, the, yeah, this one, this one here. So this this is some work uh, that, that a colleague of mine, Paul Flynn, uh, produced. Um, so it looks at inbreeding. So if we take the, the low percentage, meaning they're not that, you know, the inbreeding, there's no little or no inbreeding. And the higher the percentage you go up, the higher the inbreeding value, okay? So Clydesdales there are the ones at the very end, the highest blue bar, they're way above 25%. So, um, well, not way above, but they're quite above 25%. That's very high inbreeding. So, you know, they, these types of analysis are used for conservation purposes. Um, so we can see if we move down the bars a bit, the Connemaras are in there, they're kind of um, between five and 10%. So they're actually okay. Um, and then moving up a bit, you can see the thoroughbreds are moving up there, up around the 15%. And um, TVs are up there, up here, coming back towards the Clydesdales. You go another bit, yeah, back a bit, back a bit, back, 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 another little bit. TB, oh, coming I back see a bit. Now. Yeah, I'm slow on the uptake tonight, Romy. My eyes are taking a yeah, 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 sorry. Just. <laughs> so, like, it just gives you an idea of, yeah, okay. um, you know, begin breeding and. We can do this type of analysis with these arrays um, and very helpful for conservation. So we do have people do, doing conservation work and wanting to see what the inbreeding uh, levels are. And that helps then for breeding programs and making breeding decisions um, where you can look at individuals if they're mated together, what their inbreeding coefficient, what the offspring's inbreeding coefficient is likely to be coming out of that mating. So um, but it's, it's kind of a useful tool as well. So we get that from this as well. So that's genomic inbreeding. And then the one that people are probably hearing a bit more about is the genomic analysis or en enhancing breeding values. So at the moment, um, I suppose, like I was at the EAP meeting there recently um, in, in Switzerland. And that's the, the European Animal Production Breeding Conference. It's held every year. And um, there was a couple of presentations there, one from the the German uh, sport horses are doing some work on this and they have been genomically looking at um, their population um, based around particular phenotypes. So um, you would have already have collected phenotypic data for performance. So that it's really important that that phenotypic data is collected, collected properly st in a standardized way um, because that's used with your pedigree obviously to do your you know your breeding values uh, for performance but then if you add in the genotype on top of that or the SNP type on top of that you can improve the estimated the, the reliability or you can improve the prediction of that breeding value by actually putting in the DNA because like I was explaining earlier the blocks of DNA are are inherited you know differently from mother and father and some people some offspring get more of one trait than the other and that can can affect their performance obviously management and how they're trained and all of that kind of thing and nutrition and all of that feeds into all that as well but the genotype the, the genetics are, are you know do play their role here and the the german sport horses have implemented you know um, um a project on genomics and they're starting to snip genotype all of their a few of their different stud books and they're looking at implementing the genomics program. To do this, you need a reference population. So you need animals that have their pedigree, have phenotype that you're after, the, the defined breeding goal that you're after, whatever it is, jumping, dressage, whatever, all the different 
I'm not no expert in any of that. All the people here would be, um, and that's um, to have those data collected in a clean way is consistent very important as well. Yeah, yeah, consistent. Yeah, and so because you you need the good and the bad to be able to build up this reference population, so that when it comes to the offs, you know, and foals being born in the future, that you can make a selection at an early stage using the the pedigree data, the performance data, and the genotype. The genotype then comes into its own because you can use the genotype then to check against the reference population of the of the new unborn or the new foal, let's say, and say this the prediction for this animal's performance is maybe 70%, whereas before it might have been 50%. So you can, and that, that, that's what's been used in the, the livestock industry and cattle, dairy, all of those for um, selecting replacements and for, for selecting animals for breeding terminal animals, you know, for, you know, for carcass or whatever. Um, so I mean, when you try to explain it, this to a breeder in the sense of, I suppose at the moment, like there's breeding values that are there that are produced by the Irish Sport or Stud Book for Show Jumping. What what are what is the potential or the you know what's the the jump or the leap from there for the future? You know what? Yeah, well, I know um, I was speaking to 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 the, the Horse Sport Ireland and like there, you know, it's, it's in their future roadmap. You know, very soon they want to start looking at you know implementing genomics. Um, into into their uh, breeding programs, so um, you know, um, so you know they're very progressive, um, and uh, so yeah, like it's um, it's definitely on the roadmap here. Um, but then, like you say, I mean, the point that you've you you've made, and just maybe to stress it again, I suppose you know the the the, the gathering of that phenotypic information is is a crucial part of the whole thing as well oh, too, yeah. and so therefore yeah. if you know, if if certain breeders don't support that sort of system of collecting data, which is effectively the inspection system, then mm. you know that's that's a that's a deficit of information that is important to have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, there's one like livestock geneticist who's known globally for his his uh, his uh, quote, which is "Phenotype is king." So um, yeah, my my coffee over in Scotland. He's yeah. a well known geneticist, and he that that's his quote. Everybody quotes Mike. Phenotype yeah. is king. Yeah. So it's yeah. very important to have that that data collected. Yeah. Very important. Uh, I know there are a number of questions sitting there, and I will come to my promises okay. to people. We will give another ten minutes or so on this, just to allow those okay. questions to be answered as well, too. But um, no, we'll we'll finish out in ter in the sense of the direction that you were going with your presentation before we go to yes. those. Okay. So I th I think we're probably just just at the end there anyway. Um, oh, you are so, on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I can end. I can end there's, the there's um more. the the share on that, and I can uh, yeah. I can bring my my questions over here and have a look at them as well too. But um, yeah, so I mean, there was a there was a, a a question there. You kind of sort of when do you think when do you think you might be able to use the the SMP SNP for parentage testing and determine the genetic map? Yeah. So look, um, it, it's 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 up for discussion at the moment, um, and the the reason I suppose it hasn't happened before this is you know international agreement plus um the cost the cost of doing it um the these um snip arrays have been quite expensive for the equine because the volume hasn't been there to do them um but that's changing and we can see that that's moving you know has changed now and we can see that you know the sport horse industry in europe like we know the dutch warm bloods are, are doing a level like this as well for and particularly around prediction for OCD and that kind of thing so um yeah it's definitely on the roadmap so once it's but a lot of those have been kind of supportive breeding programs you know it's you know there's investment involved um so it's to try and get it to a point where we can do it uh, at a at a reasonable cost so that that's it's on the roadmap and we're, we're working towards that and we're and you know Horseport Ireland we've been talking to Alison um, Corbally about I mean, that the, well. econ ec the economic sort of 
accessibility of these things is really important, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't doesn't happen without that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and just kind of sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just thinking as well, you know, in the sense of I mean, I suppose you you work across the, the, the bovine and, and ovine and other sectors, as you've said. And you know, what what do you, what do you think have been some of the most progressive things or do you see are some of the most progressive things that are happening or coming there that maybe the equine side isn't, you know, quite a long stride with or may come in stride with yeah. as time goes forward. So I guess um dairy has improved incredibly. Um you know the, the production for dairy um that that's added you know about a hundred euro per lactation I think um ICBF have those statistics there's cattle breeding federation have those statistics and they do those economics around that but um, I think it's about 100 euro per lactation, um, which is quite significant. And so you're, you know, producing better animals, you know, better milk solids, better fertility. Fertility levels had gone way down because you know animals were being selected for production and not and not managing the fertility as well. So fertility has has you know improved dramatically. Um, we were but we're more complex that. beasts because we have more complex breeding goals as well too, and there's you know more yes, environmental yes. factors and different you know management factors that that can change yeah, the outcomes yeah. as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, I suppose that's it. The sheep are looking at you know their their breeding goals as well. It depends on what the breeding goal is, whether they're for terminal replacements um, within the livestock industry. Horses are obviously different, and there is a myriad of different breeding goals I guess for people you know you probably want show horses you want um jumpers you want dressage you know so well, money it, horses it, yeah <laughs> you know whatever trotters yeah. you know all the different all um yeah yeah and obviously thoroughbreds then people are looking to try and find the silver bullet there I guess you know yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah. You know, and ju just on, just as you mentioned thoroughbreds as well too and I will come back to some of those other questions and I will try and squish a few more of them in before we finish up but I mean obviously on the thoroughbred side of the sector there are you know some quite sophisticated tests that are currently on offer there like the the speed gene test and the genomic racing value and genomic breeding value and the inbreeding value and all all the rest and they can do the test for predicting height and and all the rest of it you know do you see yeah. like do you see the 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 time coming when there will be comparable offerings for the sport horse side on the basis of even of what's happening in other stud books or what you hear at the likes of oh, yeah. Yeah. the AP conferences and so forth you know what have we yeah. what's yet to come yeah definitely no there's definitely that's you know it's within the grasp of of everybody you know as i said that excuse me it's i suppose the cost has been prohibitive um doing these tests um collecting the samples and getting the data together is you know something as well um so there's a bit of investment required to get the foundation there um, but once the foundation is there, um, it's it's all possible, yeah. Going and forward. I suppose, you know, sort of tuned to that, there's kind of, I suppose, the question then as well around, you know, the the the, um, the transfer of information when you when you're using horses, you know, that are tested in one stud book and they've been used outside that stud book with a different population of animals and so forth as well, too. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's I suppose the genomics is a bit different because yeah it depends you know they might have different breeding goals or slightly different phenotypic information so that that affects you know how reliable the the genomic evaluation would be but from a parentage perspective or an identity perspective or even the disease perspective that's all transferable you know that'll all be transferable and um, like like it is normally like we do anyway you know so. Um, that's not going to change, you know, you'll still be able to send a DNA profile to another authority um, or another jurisdiction. Um, for so there's a bunch of questions here, Omi, I'll try and throw some of them at you here. Are, okay. there, are there any statistics available here for the transfer of OCD? That's a particular um, program for the KWPNs and that they, they've, they're collecting their own data. Uh, they've got all their you know all their scans they've been doing that for quite some time now 
Yeah. They've been doing that for quite a while. I believe they had something like 25 years of scans and things yeah. collected. Yeah, so and it's so kind of that is really under IP, nobody really knows. Um, that's their own program, so we, we don't have access to that. Yeah, another question here um, would Romy be able to say a little bit about the various forms of grey, including the ability to assure grey progeny from specific breedings? So grey is controlled by a gene as well, and it's basically the loss of the melanin in the in the um, in the cells, and it's progressive over time. So I'm not I'm not that kind of well up on it. We we can get animals tested for it, so you know whether they're carriers of the grey gene or not. And if they are carriers, you know they will grey progressively, you know. And um, so we can. You can, you can, I can look into that. If the, whoever that is, if they want to contact us directly, we can have a look at it for them. Yeah. Does equine metabolic disorder have a genetic marker that may be tested for? Ooh, no, that's something I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's one that where you can, 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 we can come back to over the, the, the coming mm -hmm. days. And that has come in from an anonymous attendee. So if the anonymous attendee wishes mm -hmm. to contact me directly, um, in the interim, we can look into that for you. Um, what, uh, what else is here? Um, transfer of melanomas in grey horses. I'd say that's probably okay. another one to come back to, is it? Yeah, it is. Well, you know, and uh, grey horses tend to have a high level of melanoma. Most of it is benign, yeah. um, but it's very can be very unsightly, you know. Um, uh, yeah, another, again, another one then here, there is a high high percentage of melanoma. Yeah. Another one here then is is there any test for sweet itch as an increase in Connemara's and as board horses noted? Yeah. Um there's people there's a lot of research going on on sweet itch. Yeah. It's insect insect bite hypersensibility uh, sensitivity. Um Bulicoides, and I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure what the outcome of it is, but there has been a lot of research and there are areas of the genome that have been associated with insect hypersensitivity, uh, insect bite hypersensitivity. Um, but again, something that we could look at, but I don't think there's a specific test for it just yet. There's another question here. I'll give it to you in part as such. Is it possible to identify the TIH or Connemara within the pedigree? The traditional Irish horse aspect. Ooh. Okay, traditional Irish horse. Um, that would be down to kind of population genetics and you'd have to have a cohort of animals that are con considered traditional Irish horses um, and then benchmark them against the rest of the population. It's a research project. Yeah, I think there's it. been some work under underway with that with UCD side. So with the traditional Irish Horse Association, Association yeah. yeah. So look, that's, that's something that they could, that people can can look into there. Um, what else is here that I can see that I can pick up that's easy to finish out in the last two minutes? Um, the, 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 the. I missed most of this evening's webinar. Is it possible to get a recording? For sure, hopefully we will accommodate that. Um, you just need to keep an eye on the Tagus website over the next couple of days. Um, yeah, look at, um, I think of what's there, you've covered a fair bit of it. Um, there's a, there, there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of questions coming in there from one individual, I think in France, and, and I might deal with those with you afterwards. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, to, 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 to that attendee, we'll, we'll be in touch at a later point, I think, is, is the okay. answer there, because we're, we're actually okay. running out of time to deal with those, and okay. they're a little bit more pointed in, in what they're looking for in relation to the lab side of it. So um, okay. they're probably just not quite a hundred percent for this audience here. So I suppose look at um you know we've touched off a lot of different areas there. Um, there's another one just come to say uh, yeah thank you very much for for your your contributions this evening is coming in as a as a comment there mm -hmm. as well. I suppose you know like obviously I mean what's coming across is very much that you know the the power of DNA and the power of the information that can come from DNA is phenomenal and the opportunities that are there for the future as to where you know where where that kind of science can take in in the sense of the whole genomic side of it and the information that can come to bear in the sense of you know and um, the, the 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 like the 
whole side and whether it is the health side, whether it is the performance side, whether it is conservation, all these different aspects that can all, you know, really be, be, um, yeah. be, be managed better, I guess, with the information that comes from DNA. Um, is, there, is there any kind of wrap up comment or any wrap up piece of advice or anything that you would like to share with people mm -hmm. before we close off I, this I, evening? I suppose I would just, you know, over my time working with the, the industry, you're working at the lab level um, and the industry, is that I've seen the power of it. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's such an important or it's such a valuable asset to have the DNA profiles in the database um, for, for the population. It, you know, for Ireland Inc, if you like, and, you know, the breeding um, strategies within the country um, and for our, you know, um, preserving our, you know, our indigenous, our indigenous um, um, animals and for competition and for just making sure you've got the right animal, you know, yeah, um, that's and big one, isn't it? Yeah. Right, yeah. all of that kind of thing. And um, yeah, the, the power of it is, is amazing. Like, and it, it, it's, it's moved on so much and being able to, you know, do all this genetic disease um, work and now looking at potentially genomic evaluations going forward or improving the reliability of the breeding values going forward in breeding for conservation, as you say, like there's, there's so much health and welfare um, is paramount, I guess, um, even the, the hoof all, how that can be managed now, you know, um, all those kind of things. It's, it's just, it's, science is wonderful, you know, it does oh, great things. It absolutely is, uh, yeah. absolutely yeah. is, and it, it is fascinating even just to get the little bit of insight that we've had this evening. And I know it, I know for, for the audience at home, it has been a kind of a whistle stop tour in the sense of a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of all the others. But, you know, we just wanted to give a kind of a flavor of what, you know, what kind of work you guys are doing there and a little bit of a flavor of what the opportunities and possibilities were, were are to come as well too and maybe at a yeah. later stage you know in another couple of months down the road or whatever we we might come back and have a bit of a more detailed look at at at, at uh, some of it in 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 another in another sitting um but for now i'm really yeah. really grateful to you romy for giving up your time this evening to be with us and i know you're in the office there and you still have to go home this evening so thank you very very much for for doing that for us and no uh, for I would like to say a thank you also to the viewers who have stayed with us this evening and uh, joined us and been, been participative and conversational with us as well. Um, just a note that uh, I will be back here, same time, same place, uh, on the 2nd of November with Warren Schofield of Lissadell Equine Hospital. And we're going to be discussing um, equine colic, understanding it and minimizing its occurrence. So for now, thank you very much, Romy. Greatly appreciate your time. Thank you, Wendy. And Thanks to all the readers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we will be in touch. Uh, so as, okay. as usual, the adieu and goodbye from the Zoom zone is a very rude one. And it is a click of the button and a goodbye. But thank you very much to all for, for joining us this evening. Take care and stay well, everybody. <laughs>